important part of our community. Yeah. Marianne, are you going to say something? I just love that pool. Okay, great too. I really do. I, I, I don't really know if that. the sign up is only for people who are going to say something or if it's just to, to keep track of everybody. Why? It's, 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 it's a combination. Yeah. Yeah. Is it what is yeah. We've got to get the friends in the dog. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, well, I haven't seen it before, so it's not me. No, no, it's hard to see it. We've had information. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I was just pulling oh, right. right. yeah. 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 my report. Yeah, right. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 well, go cross country and skiing in the winter, and I would get so hot I would take off every I'd be skiing in my long underwear. Connection with them to write in two of our people who did. So they basically, it's kind of like a courtesy of us. Okay. So I don't think anything to use it. I know so bad. Okay. I also don't think we'll go out of the way in the gym. No, I don't know why I wound up with this photograph. Well, I guess I'm coming in. I don't. I felt really. I felt really bad throwing it away. I'm wondering if I still have the words. I feel really bad for it. But you know, the stuff we control. So many things. Hi. Hi, Alan. I mean, I think it is what. Just waited long enough. Sooner or later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are you here to talk about life? I, are, are you going to talk about yeah. what's going on later? No. Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about just my general right. opinion about this topic. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but also later up in Unitarians and so forth. Uh -huh. We're all pretty clear about this. So, um, and I wanted to ask you, maybe I'll sit next to you, so I don't have to. Oh, well, I can move. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank the ownership oh, the same or the, the same time, but we process of the land I think it's, uh, there's a total of uh, 
40 or 50 acres that uh, the family owns. And Wayne has negotiated to a certain extent with them. Wayne's like, he's had a planning and sustainability in the city government. And he's the one who um, is responsible for the conservation of purchases, pretty much. And uh, I think his impression oh. is that the family doesn't oh, yeah, right, quite right. what they want to do with it. Wayne has had the idea that uh, the city and Lake Park could collaborate on purchasing uh, that parcel. And the part that he's most interested in is the part closest to uh, the Road. And later, I thought it'd be interesting in the note of land further south, which is continuous. <laughs> Is the video up? Do you think they really want to sell it? Or are they just... I think they really want to sell it. Okay. Yeah. Welcome everybody. They We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, first thing is, I'd like to announce that this meeting is being recorded. And uh, welcome to the public forum on pesticide use reduction in Northampton. It's uh, for the purpose of the recording. It's October 21st. 2019. And uh, for those of you who are uh, need a refresher, the uh, our committee, uh, we're going to introduce ourselves in a minute. Uh, we are the Select Committee on Pesticide Reduction formed by the City Council. And um, mm -hmm. the mission uh, that we have been given is to give advice to the City Council on feasible ways to reduce pesticide use in Northampton. Um, we have uh, been interviewing city departments to see what kinds of pesticides are being used on city land in Northampton. And um, we have a pretty short time frame. We have a report due to the city council on November 10th. So we're, uh, and we're looking forward to hearing from you all. And we've been gathering documents and testimony uh, by email as well. And we will factor all of those into our recommendations. Jim Nash uh, is going to give us a summary of what we've learned so far from our city departments. And then we're going to introduce ourselves and um, uh, talk about how, how this forum is going to run. Jim. Good people. Uh, hello. So um, back, uh, let's see, uh, March of 2019, uh, Elisa, uh, Councillor Klein and I submitted a resolution to City Council to, to form this select committee. Um, and uh, I think we convened in May, was it? Is that about right? June. Anyway. June, yeah. Um, anyway, the, uh, let's see. Uh, the committee, this is an overview of what we're supposed to be doing in terms of the resolution. Uh, the committee shall study and evaluate the city's current uh, management of turf, conservation areas, and other municipal green space, particularly around schools and other locations where children play. Uh, that was A. B, alternatives to pesticide use, including but not limited to integrated pest management and organic management. Uh, C, policies and practices from other jurisdictions to reduce pesticide use. D, estimated cost as well as potential grants, incentive programs, and other financial resources to implement pesticide reduction projects. E, recommend benchmarks with respect to the goal of achieving an overall reduction in the use of pesticides consistent with sound pest management practices and F, other related issues. Um, so um, we have met as a group on five occasions. Uh, this is our second of two public forums. Uh, much of the work during our first few meetings was organizational, selecting um, uh, officers, uh, reviewing open meeting law, and mapping how we were gonna wrap ourselves around this, this, this topic. Um, uh, early on, we agreed that providing lots of opportunity for public comment was very important. Um, we have, uh, we met with the mayor to talk about how we should uh, reach out to city 
departments. The mayor's office has been very helpful um, in, um, in arranging different administrators to come in and speak to us. Uh, we've heard from central services, which also includes the school department properties, uh, the Department of Planning and Sustainability, the Health Department, and the Department of Public Works. Um, as Adele mentioned, our report is due on November 10th, and we have a very tight schedule. And Adele has actually put together this really great summary, which I'm going to uh, read to you all right now. Nearly, uh, and this is a summary of what we've heard from the different city departments. Uh, nearly all city-owned parks, cemeteries, and athletic fields have switched to organic management methods over the last five years. The only exception is the main athletic field at Northampton High School, where conventional management, including synthetic herbicides, fertilizers, and fertilizers are used in order to maintain the field in pristine condition for the many sports teams that use the field. Parents are notified when pesticides are used at times other than during school vacations. Schools rely on contractors to control ants and rodents using mostly traps for the latter, that's the rodents. Insecticides are used by city per personnel when wasp nests are discovered near where children are at risk of being stung. DPW uses mechanical and herbicide management of tree roots in the city sewer system and rodenticides to inappropriate manholes to control rat infestation of the sewer system. To control vegetation along the levees and dikes as required by the Army Corps of Engineers, DPW uses mechanical vegetation rem removal every year but adds herbicide application in a controlled manner by a specially contracted pesticide applicator every six years um, in some areas in an effort to kill the roots of the vegetation that threaten the integrity of the levees and dikes. Uh, the Northampton Community Garden does not prohibit gardeners from using pesticides. Um, to control invasive species such as Japanese knotweed and bittersweet before they become widespread and kill native vegetation, herbicides are used at the edge of bike paths and on some city conservation land as an adjunct to mechanical removal. Goats have been used in pilot on, on a pilot basis and are believed to be useful in areas surrounded by fences where goats have little chance of escaping and uh, destroying <laughs> desirable vegetation. There is an effort uh, underway to expand this pilot goat project. Use of herbicides to control weeds in parking lots is allowed. Herbicide is not allowed on city-owned farmland adjacent to the Connecticut River, but is permitted on one parcel of city-owned property, city-owned farmland off Sylvester Road. Larvicide, BTI, is used by the health department to control disease-carrying species of mosquitoes in standing water, breeding areas such as catch basins, and areas of the meadows. BTI is not considered a toxic synthetic chemical as it is a bacterium found naturally in the soil. So that's a summary of what we've heard so far and we're all looking forward to add to that information today hearing from you. So I would like to point out that um, our definition of pesticide is the commonly uh, used definition now which includes herbicides, insecticides, rodenticides, all the biocides. Uh, so it's a kind of a generic term. This is, these are copies of the uh, summary um, of pesticide use in Northampton, um, if anyone is interested. We should just pass that around. And um, is any, we only have three people signed up, but there's a lot more than three people here. Uh, is that signed up to Pardon me? Is that sign up to speak? Uh, it is. However, if you want to just sign up and say you not speak, that's fine too. I'd like to talk. Yes, please. Please, please. Hi. Um, why don't we introduce ourselves? My name is Adele Franks. I am chairing this committee. I am an, um, um, uh, a gener generally long-standing uh, uh, advocate for 
avoiding pesticide use. And why don't we go around and introduce the rest of the oh, committee. I'm Elisa Klein, the Ward 7 City Councilor. Uh, Cynthia Swalpus, uh, representing the Board of Health in Northampton. Jim Nash, the Ward 3 City Council. I'm Kate Simmons, and I'm an environmental chemist. Adele, can I um, just add a really quick review piece? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I interrupted the last public forum in the middle to uh, clarify this because there was some confusion about it, so I think I'll start by just um, letting people know that our purview is just uh, looking at pesticide use in municipal areas, and the reason for that being that there is a state preemption law that decides how pesticides, what pesticides can be used or not used by private uh, property owners, businesses, and homeowners. So we only have, the city council only has jurisdiction over how municipal lands are managed. So that is what our purview is. We cannot um, mandate how private homeowners or private businesses can manage their private property. So just so everybody knows that when you um, deliver your comments to us. So where is our sign up sheet now? It's in the way back and it's going to the front. Oh, great. Okay, yes. Um, and we have a, a couple of folks who we uh, specifically invited to come and, and address the group, and I was one, and I'd like to ask them to speak first, um, if you're ready. Sure. I've forgotten your first name. Bob. Bob Zimmerman mm -hmm. from um, um, Broadbrook. Fitzgerald Lake Broadbrook Broadbrook Coalition. Pardon me? Broadbrook Coalition. Sorry, Broadbrook Coalition. Thank you. Um, and then Bernadette uh, uh, Giblin from uh, uh, turf management, uh, organic turf management. I'm sorry. I'm Len Cohen. Oh, and you're Len Cohen. Okay, and you're with. I'm with nothing. You're with nothing. Yes. Okay, well I'm that's with myself. good. I'm with myself. Um, yeah. yeah, well join join the crowd. All right. Um. Uh, Pat, do you want to also speak first uh, from Grove Northampton? Um, are you going to be um, offering some comments? Yes. Okay. So we're going to just ask the, the folks that we specifically invited to speak first, and you don't have to stand at the at the lectern if you don't want to, but it would be nice if you were somewhere where the ca the camera could capture you. So you're welcome to sit in any of these seats or bring a chair up or whatever you whatever makes you feel most comfortable. And when when the signed up sheet is finished, why don't somebody just bring it up to us, okay? Would you like to speak first, Bill? Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe I will just sit over here so I can face both ways at once. I'm Bob Zimmerman. I'm president of Broadbrook Coalition. We're the group that manages Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area together with the uh, Conservation Commission. Right, thank you. Conservation Commission. And we have been <coughs> waging a battle against a variety of invasive plants in the conservation area uh, fairly intensively for the last 15 years or so. <clears throat> so what is an invasive plant? An invasive plant is one that's growing um, not in its native habitat. For the most part, these are plants which have been imported in one way or another from uh, Europe or Asia, and they've gotten <clears throat> into the uh, natural habitats they tend to grow very rapidly and can completely overtake uh, a given uh, habitat if allowed to go untreated. So what are the hazards to the environment of invasive plants? <clears throat> they have a number of advantages over native plants. One is that they very often grow extremely rapidly. They uh, get started earlier in the spring than many native plants, and if unchecked, can become almost uh, a monoculture in a given habitat type. They are also, uh, many of them are abundant seed producers, so that they disperse seeds after the growing season, uh, which can germinate the following year, and in many cases, they produce many more seeds than the native plants. And they are 
for the most part, not subject to natural predators. In their native habitat, in Europe or Asia or wherever they really come from, there are normally natural predators, insects and fungi and so forth, which keep the population under control. But when they're brought to a new uh, area, those predators in general do not exist and they can pretty much proliferate without being subject to the action of, of predators. So what are the ways in which invasive plants <coughs> can be controlled? There are a large number of techniques that have been used over the years. One is hand pulling, which is appropriate in some circumstances, or digging <coughs> to get the roots of the plant, uh, mowing, burning, uh, use of biocontrol, which is the introduction of a plant predator. Usually uh, the predators are found in the native habitats of the plants. They're brought to the United States. They're tested extensively uh, for their specificity for the particular target plant <coughs> in question. And they have to be uh, approved by the USDA as well as a number of other uh, state environmental uh, organizations before they can be used. The number of uh, biocontrol agents that are <coughs> available for the kinds of plants we have, for instance, in Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area, are relatively small. They are being worked on by scientists all over the country, but it takes a very long time to develop natural biocontrol agents. In a way, it's the most satisfying of the control methods that we have available, but unfortunately, there are very few such agents which are available now. So the final method uh, that we're really here to talk about today is the use of herbicides on invasive plants. And I just want to give you a little rundown on some of our experiences at Fitzgerald Lake Conserva Conservation Area using both uh, alternative techniques as well as herbicides. The, um, we, we have used hand pulling extensively for certain invasive plants around the entrance, the North Farms entrance to the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. Um, since it's a, uh, an area that's used by a lot of people, there are also a lot of invasive plants that have been brought in in one way or another. And uh, we have garlic mustard and lesser celandine, and we have some Japanese knotweed, multiflora rose. Um, every year we go out and <clears throat> try to clear out as many of the invasives as possible along that macadam path that runs from the North Farms parking lot into the dam. That's where uh, we find a lot of uh, in invasives, not too much beyond that point. So um, we have uh, generally been successful in that effort. Each year we find fewer and fewer plants. and. Um, is something that we'll uh, pursue in the future as well. Another major hand pulling effort is removing water chestnut, an aqueous um, invasive plant, from Fitzgerald Lake. A number of years ago, uh, we found that certain parts of the lake were just being overtaken by water chestnut. And in the last few years, um, we have adopted a technique, a method, an approach called pull early, pull often, where we go out five times during the summer, starting in June, go out at three week intervals in kayaks and canoes and other kinds of boats, and pull water chestnut. And over the past three years, we've seen dramatic decreases in the amount of water chestnut. So it appears that this approach is succeeding. Three years ago, we, uh, we pulled something like 1,100 pounds over the summer. Last year, uh, about 300 pounds, and this year we're down to, uh, I forget exactly, 190, 200 pounds. So these hand pulling techniques were appropriate, can be very effective. But there are a number of invasive plants <coughs> that can't really be approached by hand pulling or digging because of the large area over which they're dispersed. Mowing and uh, burning are just not <clears throat> practical methods of invasive weed control in, uh, 
in places like Cook's Pasture, which is internal in the conservation area. So we have uh, been using uh, <clears throat> a program of herbicide control. The herbicide is applied by a licensed um, applicator, and uh, we have also seen considerable success. And I'll just mention a couple of these, um, and I'll mention some of the agents that have been used. The agents have been chosen for their specificity for plants, in some cases for specific kinds of plants, for their um, uh, uh, their lack of persistence in the environment. They're, many of them are destroyed by bacterial or fungal action after a relatively short period of time. And uh, herbicides that can be uh, applied in a very selective way. And this involves the use of low volume spray in many cases, uh, where the uh, herbicide uh, is uh, sprayed on a given plant, a specific individual plant, and um, with remarkable specificity. And we've found that in most cases, there is very little collateral damage to plants in the neighborhood of those which have been sprayed. The, uh, one of the uh, major efforts has been to clear two invasive plants from Cook's pasture, glossy buckthorn and some other uh, species of buckthorn, and spotted napweed. And uh, over the years, this has proved uh, relatively successful. We're not completely uh, free of those invasive plants. But at one time, there were parts of Cook's pasture which were virtually monocultures of glossy buckthorn, which are now full of native plants, uh, many different species of rhododendron, speckled alder, grasses, and so forth. And it's really been quite uh, satisfying to see that occur. Most of that spraying has been done with an herbicide called uh, triclopyr. Triclopyr is a, what's called a synthetic auxin. Auxin is a chemical substance produced by most plants, which uh, is a uh, internal growth hormone, promotes growth. When a synthetic auxin like triclopyr is used, it disrupts the growth <coughs> regulation of the plants and leads to the plant's death. The, uh, another Herbicide, uh, about which there has been much controversy, especially in recent years, is glyphosate, which is found in herbicides such as uh, Roundup, Rodeo, um, Arsenal, a number of other trade names. There are a lot of trade names which are used for products which contain uh, glyphosate. We've used glyphosate very effectively in the Broadbrook Marsh which was at one time very badly uh, infected with uh, Phragmites, common reed. And <clears throat> once again, uh, through a persistent and very specific application of the herbicide, we've gotten rid of pretty much all of the Phragmites in the Broadbrook Marsh. And what was reassuring was that within the year, uh, those areas which had been infested with Phragmites were full of cattails and other native plants. And we had a survey done <clears throat> by an aquatic botanist who found 30 different species of plants in those areas which have been, uh, of native plants in those areas which have been treated with glyphosate. Um, the, um, the way in which it is applied, once again, uh, the interior of the high density areas of Phragmites were sprayed with low volume sprayers. It's very gentle spray, which is applied to the plants. And these um, herbicides contain something called a surfactant, which uh, helps them actually stick, the, the little droplets stick to the plants uh, so that uh, they will affect the plants which are sprayed specifically and the herbicide will not drift outside the treated area. On the periphery, 
<coughs> of the stems of Phragmites, uh, uh, an even more careful procedure was used. The stems were cut, and individual plants were actually injected with the herbicide. Now, the, uh, there's lots to be said about the uh, benefits and, and some of the disadvantages of using glyphosate. It's not uh, specific. It will affect all plants. Uh, but it does, uh, it is limited in its dispersal in the environment by the property of binding to clays and soil particles. So that <coughs> it's not, um, uh, it doesn't get into the, uh, the, the water stream readily. And in fact, when we used uh, glyphosate in the Brook Marsh, we actually took samples of the water downstream from the point of application and have them analyzed by uh, an outside uh, chemical analysis company, which found that there was essentially a negligible amount of glyphosate getting into the broadway downstream of the point of application. Now, <coughs> I would be uh, remiss not to acknowledge the controversy that has surrounded the use of glyphosate in recent years. Uh, there are some studies and organizations which have uh, established what they believe to be a correlation between glyphosate use, particularly very heavy glyphosate use in agricultural areas, and the incidence of Hodg <coughs> non-Hodgkin's lymphoma type of, of cancer. There have been other studies which uh, contest that uh, analysis, which uh, was published as one very well known study, which was published in 2015 by an organization linked to the World Health Organization, which um, appeared to establish a, kind of, uh, a relationship, a causal relationship between glyphosate use <coughs> and uh, non Hodgkin's lymphoma. That was later countered by a major study by the National Institutes of Health, the National Cancer Institute, the National uh, uh, Institute of Environmental Sciences, which observed that uh, in, a, in a vast statistical analysis that um, there was no such linkage between glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and in fact that the WHO study had left out uh, a quite a lot of important data which would have run counter to their conclusions. So um, we're at a point now where there's a, a still quite a bit of question about the use of glyphosate. Uh, it's not, um, it hasn't been resolved in a satisfactory way and uh, glyphosate remains probably the most commonly used herbicide worldwide. So I think I'll stop at that point, and if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Paul. Anybody have any quick questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, Bernie Depp, would you like to speak next? <laughs> I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, I'd like to sit down. Sit down. <laughs> Well, this room doesn't lend itself for that, you know? I <laughs> know. We also welcome submission of documents. Great. Thank you. So I want to start by um, saying hi, I'm Brenda Giblin. I've lived in Northampton for about 30 years. Um, I really want to thank all of you for the generosity of your spirits to sit on this committee because I know it's not an easy task and that you're lending all your um, expertise um, to do a thoughtful review and have a community-wide conversation. 
um, about the reduction of pesticides. Could so, I ask folks to speak up? I'm a little hard of hearing, even with my hearing aids, and I can't, I didn't hear anything you just said, Bernadette. I'm so sorry. I told them, <clears throat> bravo. <laughs> you know, we actually have assistive devices, but I think we can't get to them because they're locked in the room back there, but I'll see if we can get, we can get in there. Thank you. <clears throat> Why don't I give you my handouts? <clears throat> That I want you to get lost again. Maybe that'll be perfect. What's your It's great to have one. We would appreciate it if you could uh, speak to us for about 10 minutes. Yeah. So that we make time for a uh, yeah. I won't share much more than. Um, okay. Thank you. And it would be wonderful if you could speak louder. Okay. Thank you. I'll try. Um, so I'm Bernadette Giblin. Everybody can hear me? Yes. Thank you. Stand thank up. You. Rock this room. <laughs> Sit in the middle. Um, Channel Johnny's energy. Many of you might know me as a former, I was a landscape contractor. Um, I really did not pick being involved in the landscape industry. Uh, in 1996, I was unexpectedly widowed, and um, I found myself the unlikely owner of um, my late husband's uh, lawn care and snow removal company. And as a widow, I walked behind four foot wide lawnmowers, and every winter for a dozen years climbed behind the wheel of a plow truck. Um, I seemed to be find myself in an industry that was bent on conquering na nature and beating her back into submission rather than working in alliance with her. It sent me back to college where I studied as an Ada Comstock scholar at Smith College, raised my kids, got my degree, was also running my business. And when I graduated, my sole intention when I earned that degree and they called clapped was to get out of that truck and the landscape industry. And so when I took the year off to study for the GRE and pursue a PhD in health psychology, I found I needed some money still. And I decided to um, <coughs> green my company. And I earned my accreditation from the NOFA Organic Land Care Program. And I became an accredited organic land care professional. I had a dream one night in which I woke up in a cold sweat, um, concerned about the safety and health of my children on lawns. And I said to myself, if I'm going to run a company, I'm only going to run a company that I would actually hire. So I named my company Safe Ground Organic Land Care and had the mission to protect people, pets, and the planet from the unnecessary risk of pesticide applications. I guess I had thought that institutions and municipal governments, this was back in 2005, would embrace organic practices and um, in a couple of years would get to see the miraculous healing powers of organic um, interventions that I was seeing every day in my job. I did work with Cooley Dickinson Hospital Congregation B'nai Israel, our Lander Grinspoon Academy, the Cancer Care Center um, at Bay State Medical, as well as countless other commercial and residential clients across Western Massachusetts. My work expanded into consulting and grant writing. I was awarded two Toxic Use Reduction Institute grants that took chemicals off the Pines Theater at Look Park and then at five athletic fields in Western Massachusetts. I did a return on investment analysis as part of a regional Turi grant to show that the pay book back from switching from conventional to an organic program would happen after just two years. I also worked on a U.S. Fish and Wildlife grant that looked at educating landscapers in the use of organic practices to reduce the pollution from nitrate runoff that was depleting aquatic health in our Long Island Sound. 
I became an educator for the Connecticut Organic Land Care Program. And it was there that I actually witnessed um, training landscape professionals, just like I once was, um, that Connecticut had enacted a ban on school grounds. And they did a three-year phase in. But literally, most of the landscapers did not show up for any of the training during that three-year period until the period of transition was over and the use was prohibited in January. In New York, I was once a sustainability coordinator. That's where I really saw that it was my job to use return on investment strategies to actually bring sustainability to communities at no additional cost. While I was in New York, the state of New York, just like Connecticut, passed a ban on using pesticides on school playing fields. Um, I will just tell you briefly that I'm sharing all this with you because despite the fact that I worked really hard to train professionals, many of the sites when I returned from my time away in New York back to Northampton, had actually returned to the use of conventional products, despite the fact that they had been given grant funding and training. And that made me really sad because I actually saw, and maybe you want to pass this around, um, when I did this analysis, was that communities would actually be saving money. And if there's one thing that organics always gets nailed with is what? Expense. Thank you. Right. So the truth is, just like the way Chris, what's his last name, our sustainability guy? Mason. Uh, Chris Mason switched over all the light bulbs to save us money. We have an opportunity, just like we've done with cleaning products, just like every other carbon emissions problem we're facing in the climate change era, we have an opportunity to start helping to heal our incredibly um, damaged soils that have really been bombarded with these products year after year, really through no fault of their own. These um, wonderful contractors, and I've worked with countless people in municipal government, they're under a lot of pressure, playing fields have a lot of compaction, Turf grasses, though, are a complex system that require a lot of maintenance and care. And there is a way that you can do it organically. And due to my, and I, and I really want to applaud what I've heard about Rich Parasoletti um, and his embrace of organic practices and eliminating some of these hazardous products that we can go back and forth. You know, you can have chemical companies who pay for research to prove efficacies of products and use incredibly militaristic terms to describe plants to make us feel like we're engaged in a battle. The earth is literally where we all plant our feet every day and we have to enter into a relationship with healing these disturbed soils. So I wanted to tell you that I got on the phone with my network and all my friends because I've actually retired from work completely. And I really was actually looking forward to talking to one of my old friends. But while I did that, I talked to my colleague, Jim Osborne, who was once my teacher, <coughs> co-teaching with him. He is the national leader in training municipalities how to embrace an organic program on um, their playing fields, their parks, their community lands. He told me about this really cool grant program from Stonyfield Yogurt that they started last year when it was their 35th anniversary. <clears throat> what they're hoping to do is they're hoping to provide grant opportunities to 35 communities in the United States so that they can show parents how they can have organic play areas for their kids. And they can train municipalities and they'll bring chip in, they'll give you 5K, uh, they'll work with you for two years. They also have partnered in this program that they designed to bring in Beyond Pesticides. Beyond Pesticides is the national nonprofit in Washington that works a lot legislatively um, to bring these kind of resources to local communities who are grappling with this same thing, trying to create safer policies for the protection of public health. 
So I talked to Chip, and part of why I was late this morning was that he called me back and he told me that he sort of mentioned to Stony Field that North, or Northampton might be interested in um, signing on for the grant project and transitioning um, school grounds because like I've had the opportunity to learn um, from my city councilor, you now all know what I've been walking around with for 10 years, which is the Northampton High School is putting True Green Kemlon on their football field. And you now also know what I know, because as a, I used to go to pesticide bureau trainings where they literally taught the contractors how to work around the notification process to parents. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is apply the, the pesticides um, at that five days window where the kids aren't on the school grounds. So the, I actually know the author of that state law, uh, Bill Ravanisi, whose child was sprayed, and that was what profoundly impacted him to write the law. And at the time, he was thinking, this will be great. Parents will be notified. They'll start to have a conversation. Well, people aren't being notified. So the truth is, we need to act. And we, and we often think these other bodies are protecting us, and they're not. Um, Bernadette, just sorry to interrupt you, but just so that you know, we registered with Stonyfield Farm a few months ago, so they were on their Great. radar, and they know we know about the program, and we have it as part of our Bravo. investigation into possible grants and other opportunities. I'm so happy because, Alisa, just for haha's -ha last night, and in fact, I, the whole printout of the Beyond Pesticide page didn't really come out that good. But I went on, um, they have this really cool part of the site where you can go and you can look at IPM programs of any school in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. in any community right. in America. Mm -hmm. And I was really stunned to see Chicopee is not using. East Hampton is not using. Hampshire Regional is not using. Um, is not I, using pesticides. Is not using pesticides on their school ground. It's public information. Any of you can go and look on the Beyond Pesticides website, and what you'll be looking at is like they have to submit IPM reports. And IPM reports are integrated pest management reporting. Basically, what the law requires you to do is it doesn't. It says just write down what you're going to use. You have to have a plan. In fact, I actually was encouraged in um, bureau meetings to write down even more than you wanted to use. So you can use more. You know, you never want to not be able to use. So my point about legislation, and that is really what I, I want to say to you, is that wherever I've seen people come in and get training, and they didn't put some sort of regulation and policy in place through a legislative effort, folks will just unknowingly go back to what they know. They'll return to their cultural script, and it's like a lot on drugs, and each site is like you and I. Would you go into a doctor and take a prescription for strep throat if you hadn't had a strep test? Right. So anyway, I just want to say lastly, there are currently four independent proposed bills before a state legislature, one of which is on behalf of the pollinators. You can do it this cherry picker way, one chemical at a time, um, there's also one to roll back pre-exemption. Um, so that means each community gets their own home rule and gets to decide if they want to have an even more stringent policy to protect their um, citizens. I, I also want to say, too, that um, you know, for the purposes of this conversation, I really want to focus on this low-hanging fruit of let's get this done in Northampton. Let's get these kids these long chemicals off playing fields, I think this is definitely something wonderful for our community health. <coughs> Secondly, I will say, it's unfortunate, you know, these products came out of war. That's really where they were founded. And often when we enter into a discussion as a community, we get very um, adversarial to each other. And I know in the past, um, when we've talked about the invasive plant topic. It, it's, so we've got these different sites and we've got these different needs. But I will say what you, I have to say to you lastly, in good conscience, a lot of this, the term invasive came from chemical companies. 
<laughs> and then underwrote research to get to give us this feeling like we are being attacked. It's very militaristic language. All these products have militaristic names, and they literally say militaristic terms: collateral, vector. Like we're not don't, like we're not affecting life and living things. And what they are is they are opportunistic of poor soil conditions. And we're living right now in a climate change era where we have plants moving around because soils are so disturbed. We need to be testing soils. I, was, I wanna applaud the Broad Book folks. I was in a boat five years ago, <laughs> pulling water chestnut with you, remember Bob? I do. And, 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 and I'm, I'm so great to hear that that is ha continuing to happen because that's how a mechanical approach works. You start to see it year two, year three, instead of this like, we gotta do a quick fix. And honestly, they're trying on every front. But realize, these health risks, every day, you're learning that stuff that was just affecting aquatic life is now affecting mammalian life. Our children are sick. Um, I also want to just say to you that um, I do need to wrap up. Peter, I would like <coughs> you to look at the work of Peter Del Tigre, Harvard professor, who shows um, how the invasive plants come in after Berlin is calmed out. And that's what's happening. Stuff is bombed out. We've got six soils. Northampton is a community of incredible compassion and incredible loving kindness. And I really want to thank you for listening to me and, um, and encourage you to um, you know, embrace this program in whatever way I can help you. I am here as a faithful servant as well. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Appreciate that. Bernadette mentioned that there are oh, four questions. Um, I didn't think so. Mm. We're just we're time sensitive because we have a lot of people here. <laughs> Bernadette mentioned that there are four bills in the state house right now, and we had uh, Marty Dagoberto from uh, NOFA, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, come to our last hearing, and he um, handed these out. Yeah, you can pass them around. It's just information about the public hearing that's happening on November twelfth for those bills. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna. Um, uh, ask people to speak briefly. Um, Leonard Cohen, did you want to say something? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me. I want to just mention that I also pulled some water chestnut back <laughs> a while ago. And, uh, I labeled a bunch of invasive plants also, which I don't know what happened to them. But um, I, I, I want to address the key issue to me is is, is, uh, is like I say a carcinogen. And is it are people who use it susceptible to carcinogenesis? So um, this is uh, one of the most controversial and strange areas I've ever been in. I well, let me just mention I've been in cancer research for thirty years. I'm the editor of a journal called Nutrition and Cancer. Uh, I was involved in a study called ALR. I don't know if you all remember. Mm. It's a substance that allows apples to rapidly um, uh, grow so they could easily be, all be picked at the exact same time. And we did some studies and showed it was immunogenic. And they took it off the market. And um, immunogenic doesn't mean carcinogenic, but it's one of the early steps in carcinogenesis. And later on, they found that it could accelerate cancer cells to grow. So I think I have some background in this that may be helpful here. Um, uh, and just a little background. Glyphosate is a really tiny molecule. Uh, it is basically an amino acid, which is a building block for proteins with a phosphorus in it. And it's the simplest amino acids, glycine. So it's a very small, very simple molecule very unusual because most of pesticides are kind of a complex molecule. So this is a very simple one. And what it does is it blocks an important pathway in the growth of green plants. It does not have an effect on mammals at all in terms of their, 
metabolism. But it, as Bob mentioned, it also affects every green plant. So invasive, non-invasive, it makes no difference. So it is a not what they call a non-selective substance. Um, this creates a problem right away because the minute you give it, it will kill potentially anything that is a green plant that's growing. It reminds me a little bit of an antibiotic. It kills not only the destructive bacteria, but also kills healthy bacteria in our colon. So that it is not selective and enough. Um, the other thing, it's been around for 40 years, and I don't know the number, but it's roughly billions of pounds of glyphosate has been put on farms and things all over the world now for 40 years. And so it's all out there already. And it's usually broken down pretty quickly. I think it's 30 days, or I'm not sure, 30 days? Or 30 60, days. 60 days, something like that. Yeah. It is water soluble, so it can get into the water. Um, and as Bob mentioned, it has, it's never given by itself. It's given with surfactant, so it sticks on the things. Many people say the surfactant itself creates a problem on top of that. Um, the, uh, the real question about, and please remind me of the time I go okay. The real question is when the IARC, which was the, <coughs> the uh, group that did the first study on carcinogenesis, they took only published papers, and most of them were studies done in animals because the human studies had not all been done. I think there was one at the time. And what they found was they called it a probable carcinogen, which is they have all these categories, and this one, like arsenic, is considered a carcinogen, and this is considered a probable one. Um, and they did that on the basis of studies in animals, which sometimes use pretty large amounts of this material. So, so the question is whether this is really um, appropriate to put it on to what's going on with the small amounts that humans might ingest and so on. Um, so um, when they published the thing, there was a huge uproar. Monsanto did some very stupid things. They went out and they started to try to undermine the scientists who did the study in IARC. There was a big scandal. Le Monde, the French newspaper, went through it. And it was very embarrassing. They tried to intimidate people. They tried. So this made people think, huh, they must have be hiding something. Then the, the EPA here, the EPA in Canada, did a study, and they said, no, it's not a carcinogen. And when you looked at what was in the two studies, the EPA study used information from Monsanto that was never published out in the open literature. It was sent to them as proprietary information, and the EPA used it, but it was used in the analysis. Now, the problem is that Monsanto's work is done by scientists who are paid, even outside ones, and I happen to be one of those people who once received money from industry, and they don't say to you, we're going to you know, undermine you if you publish something we don't like. What they do is they simply say, publish whatever you want, but if it's not what we like, we're not going to fund anything else you ever do. <laughs> so, so you get basically banished. Mm -hmm. And I was banished twice. But that's just the way it, it works. And, and so what I'm saying is that the amount, the type of information that people are using to make the analysis is what's critical. And unless there's more and more studies by independent people, we will never know exactly whether this is a carcinogen or not. So I understand now that there is a big, big study being, being um, Bayer is now owns Monsanto. There's a big study that they are going to fund to cover all of this stuff. And the big question is whether or not they're going to allow independent sciences to do this or whether they can interfere with what goes on. Because there's a lot of money involved in this. This is a huge company, and this is a, we're talking about really billions of dollars are involved in this industry. So, um, so let me just say what, what, what I see, and I've searched around the literature. Oh, I just wanted to mention, the, the one study, I think Bob mentioned, there was a study on people who worked in, on fields applying, applying this stuff. Mm -hmm. And they did, they found one cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a, 
relatively rare tumor of the lymph glands, and it, um, they found, and, and it's very rare, so the numbers of people who actually got it are kind of small, so they needed a larger, larger study than they've done. But anyway, they did find an increase for those who worked in the fields. They also found that a lot of, um, a lot of people who, the companies that do the, the, the application, do not give the workers the proper equipment <laughs> so they get exposed like crazy. A lot of them are working, from what I understand, in a shirt, pants, no gloves, no nothing, and just going spraying stuff. And so the, the amount of exposure is really, really high, way higher than somebody who would go out here and spray a few things. So the, the real issue is this huge amount of of, um, of uh, this material that goes out onto these fields and these people are not protected. And that was the, that was the, that was the study, that, and they're doing another one now. So as far as I know, that's the only, if anybody else knows, that's the only two studies so far in humans, and there's another big one in the process, and we should find out from that. One other thing is that... Lynn, I'm just I'm conscious of time, sure. if you could... Summarize your yeah. main points, so, that would be So what, what I want to say is, I have one, one other point I want to make. Like every other substance, evolution is at work. And so there are now weeds that are resistant to glyphosate. Mm -hmm. And they are growing in many, many different countries. And it's pretty soon, it's been 40 years, there will be lots of weeds with bread mm -hmm. They're going to have to find another company to keep this process over and over. So um, to put simply, as far as I can see, from what I've seen in literature, the, the, this, is, this substance is out there for 40 years. It's pretty obvious that there's no major outbreaks of cancer that I've seen. It is gradually going to get into food, and it is into food. It's not a mutagen, as far as I understand. And the, um, uh, the, we're going to have to wait until these big studies come in to see whether it is or is not. So far, I would say this. It appears that it is a, not a carcinogen, but it is something that may promote something that has already occurred, a carcinogenic event, and it may promote the continuing, or, the, or the, what they call a promotion effect mm -hmm. on this cancer. And, and, and it could take over years, we're talking 10, 20, 30 years, the promotion effect could take place. So with that, I, I'm, I hate to say it's, it's question mark here, mm -hmm. but the, um, the evidence for the carcinogenesis is, is it's got a question mark, mm -hmm. okay. but it's Thank a you. potentially, potentially a dangerous compound, okay. potentially. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. I'm going to now go down the uh, list of signer uppers, and for those who have come in later and who have not yet signed up, um, please feel free to. Um, Put your name on this list. Uh, Pat James. Speak up. Oh, good morning. Um, I'm Pat James. I'm the manager of the Grow Food Northampton Organic Community Garden. And um, for the next couple of months anyway, the interim executive director of Grow Food Northampton. <coughs> so I, I want to talk about our community garden a little bit. Um, when it started, when we bought the land in 2010, um, this is land that had been farmed conventionally. And I want to pay attention to the language and how the language has been usurped. Um, because 150 years ago, probably not even that long, maybe even 50 years ago, if we talked about conventional farming, we would have been talking about organic farming, mm -hmm. right? We would have been talking about using the resources of the land and the soil and the people to keep the land and the soil and the people healthy. And somehow that language got usurped and conventional farming became chemical farming. And I'd like to challenge this group to start to rethink that mm -hmm. and start to have a different approach to what we think of as conventional. Because when we talk about something as conventional, there's an assumed kind of acceptance of it. It must be okay because it's conventional. 
So I'd just like to suggest that. So we had this land that had been conventionally farmed for a long time, and the soil was, as it downloads, not great, um, not even very alive. And now here we are in 2019 with land that is almost edible, soil that's almost edible, it's so good. And, um, and it's, you know, you can put your hands in it and pull a handful of dirt out of it and see this life, just life, life, life everywhere, um, which you don't get with a lot of chemical farming um, because there's been such a non-nuanced approach to chemical farming let's just spray a lot of stuff everywhere and then hope the things that we want to grow will grow. Um, organic doesn't take that approach. Organic takes the approach that if we heal the soil and if we feed the soil, the soil will feed the plants and the plants will feed the people. And then the people can feed the soil again. Um, it's not all that complicated, but because we've accepted this notion of conventional as being something else that you have to go and pay a lot of money for and hire people to use and build a lot of laws around it, um, that somehow organic is harder and organic is more expensive. And I'm so glad you brought that chart in. Um, I've also seen this work. Um, years ago, I had the wonderful opportunity to meet T. Flesher, who's done a lot of work in this area. Um, there's a wonderful study that he did of Harvard Yard, managing half of it conventionally and half of it organically. And the results are astonishing um, in terms of the difference in the vibrant health of the organically managed parts of the land. He also was the person who restored Battery Park after 9-11. You know, this was a highly poisoned, highly toxic, um, you know, who knows what fell on that piece of land. And he used only organic methods to heal the soil and to bring it back. And if you ever get a chance just to go down there and walk through and understand what this was and to see pictures of what it looked like on 9-12, um, you'd be uh, humbled by what he was able to accomplish and what they were able to accomplish. And the community that got built around the organic management practices that enabled that healing, so that you had a bunch of people in lower Manhattan starting to compost in their apartments and bike people picking up the composted material and taking it. So there's a way to do this. There are many ways to do this that are creative and healthy and energizing and community building. Um, and, and I think it's worth looking at that and reclaiming language around what could be conventional is also organic. Um, however, um, I also think that if we can get ourselves out of the notion of wanting the immediate gratification of spraying a poison on a weed and watching it die, and instead thinking more big picture about how do we create an environment that will support the healthy plants that we want to have, um, we could leave ourselves some space to have a more nuanced approach for the rare times that chemical management might be the better thing to do. But I think now that we've been so toxified by the broad spectrum use, I actually appreciate the, um, the uh, antibiotic um, analogy that you made. Having just gone to the doctor for a cold, viral, and been offered antibiotics, which only treat bacteria, you know, there's this sort of notion of, well, we'll throw something at it and make it work. And you know, we need to give ourselves the, the patience that nature has to heal herself and to be well. Um, so I would like to invite everybody to come and look at, I mean, the garden is being in fall now, but it's healthy. And it's alive, and the soil is alive. And, and I want people to, to understand that if we take an approach that has a much more nuanced evaluation of how we use chemicals um, in 
a world where we're mainly going to use organic approaches, we might not have to worry so much about um, you know, drilling down to how carcinogenic is it because we're not going to have such a big exposure to something that um, might or might not be toxic. So, um, so just to sum up, let's call conventional and organic the same thing. You know, we could be a community that could change this definition. And I'd sure love to try. Thank you. Thank you. Marianne LaBarge. Thank you. I'm here in due to um, two letters that were sent from my residents um, who live near the farmland on Sylvester Road. My question is of getting a reply back from Wayne Biden to Ashley. And I have to disagree with some of that statement. When he first states that Ashley men mentions in her email, we have a strong right to farm ordinance. Yes, we do. We've had this ordinance in place for several, several years, and I was a co-sponsor with Council <coughs> Ward 3, knowing all the farmers throughout the city. Times have changed, and I mean changed. Yes, they were using pesticides, whatever. But now we have a big problem here. We have Roundup. I would never use it. And I am also going to use an example of the landfill property owned by the city of Northampton. We had a significant amount of cancer around the whole perimeter of the landfill, mm -hmm. even including dogs and cats that died of cancer. A lot of research was done by Dr. Joanne Cassette, who also was a cancer doctor on my ward and still is on my ward. So I have great concerns when I hear a statement being made, the right to farm ordinance, okay, which is true, but times have changed. I also feel that I'm hearing about conventional <coughs> farming. I agree with that. I agree with my residents. We need to look at the factor here of Roundup being used on city property on Sylvester Road. I have great concerns about that. Research itself, we haven't heard much, except for on TV or in the papers, on Facebook, of all the lawsuits that are occurring with people with cancer. But we don't hear about what type of cancer or either how that lawsuits are going. So my main concern is that I feel with the Parsons property, for years and years, they did start off with a different type of farming there and then went into doing the corn. I feel that in due respect, that there should be a full length discussion with the planning department, with Wayne, and with the Agricultural Commission in regards to working with Mr. Parsons and all the residents, all the residents off of Sylvester Road and along the perimeter of how we can make our residents be safe. Be safe. That's the biggie right there. The quality of life for every child, for every parent on Sylvester Road. And that perimeter is very large. It goes towards Seven also. So my main concern is every time that Mr. Parsons is going to go ahead and use whatever, the Roundup, whatever, that there is signage being posted along the sides of the roads for every resident, everybody who is biking, and I have a tremendous amount of elderly and whatever, a mixture of diversity, who do use Sylvester Road to get onto Chesterfield Road or go to Leeds. So I feel a heavy conversation needs to be done here because I feel my residents in Ward 6 and in Ward 7, I think the quality of life to me is number one. Number one. I think that it's unfair to say, well, nuisance, because yes, there were farmers in the city who were complaining, like in Ward 3, 
and Ward 7 about manure and on my ward. And I mean, that to me, that doesn't bother me. It's when you're using chemicals, pesticides or anything. All right, I want facts down here and I want everybody to be safe. And that's what our responsibility is for every department in this city. So I'm asking that hopefully that we can get some form of committee organized with the planning department, with Wayne Biden, the Agricultural Commission, Mr. Parsons. We need to help him in any way we can. He has been farming there for a long, long time, and that is his livelihood. And I will not take away anybody's livelihood. So I think we can come to a very good compromise. Halfway, we heard it today. Okay, go organic and do the other half. Let's gradually get in it. But I feel that there should be visibility and transparency of allowing and letting every resident throughout the city and even around the perimeter of that cornfield of signage being posted on the side of that road to be aware. Thank you. Do you happen to know how, how many acres that field is? Well, geez, I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Well, thank you very sure. much for it's your quite a bit. <laughs> Something I didn't, Marianne, what, what was Mr. Parson's position? What do you mean position? What, what, was, what was he doing that evidently somebody objected to? He sprays Roundup because he grows Roundup ready corn. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, he's been doing this. He, first of all, didn't have a different type of farming going on. Then he went into the cornfields. Mm -hmm. And that's where the problem's been. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, is there a key to the bathroom? I'm sorry? Is there a key to open the bathroom? It should be open. Should be open right? I tried it in his lock. You can go to the, um, into the parking, you know, the, the office that's right on your left. Oh, okay. You can come in the door and ask them. For you. Thank you. And if you could ask them to let the, um, the person who manages that know to come and open the door that there's a meeting going on here, they'll sure. get that. Thank you. So I'm Hetty Geis. I have joined, I joined a uh, co cooperative organic gardening group 40 years ago and have been gardening that way to, I mean, yesterday I pulled my leaks and sure enough the soil was alive with all kinds of things. Um, I went to a training in how to identify invasive plants that uh, that Broadway um, sponsored, and I wanted to, and they did talk about the time kind of feel it's necessary to use glyphosate, and I wanted to bring you just a real. This is what they recommended I use to apply it. So, I have some invasive plants that they said would not go away if I didn't kill the roots, the deep roots. And so I put a little bit of glyphosate in here and some water and some blue dye so that I can tell exactly where it goes. And I can tell you that the plants around it are thriving. It's the, the plants I put it on die and the plants crowding in around them are healthy. So it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're very careful. Mm -hmm. I want to also talk about um, emerald ash borers because 10 years ago when we weren't sure when they were going to invade here, I was one of the volunteers that went around to try to uh, get a head, heads up on that and I did that by going to an identified uh, site for Cerceris wasps. The Cerceris wasps live in the ground. They don't sting people. They, they collect beetles. And so to try to find them, bring beetles back, and I, identifying the beetles they brought would help us know when the emerald ash borer beetles 
were approaching our area. So one of the sites I was assigned to, the only site in Northampton, was at the Jackson Street School in their um, ball field. And I, you know, I found the wasps and I collected the beetles and sent them in to be identified. And over the period of three years, it was clear to me that someone was spraying the weeds on that field. Mm. So that where there were weeds that were mowed on the field, three years later, there were no weeds and there were no more wasps. The wasps had died too. Now, it was my understanding that that wasn't supposed to be happening in Northampton at that time, but it was. And so, whatever we decide to do, I think it's really important that every single custodian is trained in what is important to do. My suspicion at the time, and I didn't follow up on it, was that these guys just wanted the ball field to look good. And the easiest thing to do was to just kill everything on it. I doubt that that was the city policy. It was just the guys trying to do a good job. So please include training for every single employee that has Thank you. Access what year to was it. that? Hmm? What year was it that you were actively that was, sampling that was Street? About 10 years ago. And that was at Jackson Street School. And that was at Jackson Street School. And so, yeah, all, all, all of the last died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mega? Thanks so much. I hope that's, I didn't mess up your fine. name. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Vega. I'm a lifelong Northampton resident. Um, and first, I'd like to share a little about my personal experience with herbicides and then talk about my feelings about Northampton's use of glyphosate. Um, so, for the past 10 years, I've been living in Northampton and I live next to Smith College in a first floor apartment that looks out onto one of the college lawns. Um, additionally, for the past 10 years, I have been getting very sick each year in the early summer. Um, acute symptoms have included nausea, vomiting, headaches, skin rashes, and sores around and inside my mouth. Uh, longer term symptoms lasting for months have included fatigue, joint pain, hormonal difficulties, and increasing chemical sensitivity. Doctors have not been able to find any medical cause for any of these symptoms. Um, and it was only after several years living in that place that I noticed a direct correlation between the day that the pesticide warning signs go up on Smith lawns and the day I get sick every year. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point, I was after, after living there for a few years, I contacted Smith to find out what chemicals they were spraying. Um, and I was quite upset to learn that they included herbicides, uh, one being a chemical called 2,4-D, mm, which is half of Agent Orange, yeah. um, and it's a volatile chemical, so that means that it does not stay where you spray it. So if they spray it in the lawn next to my house, that is going to go up into the air, stay in the air for days, and come into my house and coat everything inside my house, and so I'll be breathing that as much as I would if I was sitting on the lawn that was sprayed. Um, and uh, 2,4-D has been linked in scientific studies to hormone disruption, neurotoxicity, developmental toxicity, reproductive toxicity, and cancer. Dozens of studies show a link between 2,4-D and thyroid disorders. Um, Smith has also been spraying another herbicide called dicamba, uh, which is also volatile, meaning it doesn't stay on the lawns. It'll travel up to half a mile. Um, and it's also linked to cancer risk as well as nervous system damage. In animal studies, rats exposed to dicamba showed an increased frequency of malignant lymphomas and thyroid cancers. The European Union classifies dicamba as a category two suspected endocrine disruptor. Sadly, these are only two of the chemical ingredients among multiple products that Smith has been spraying across their campus next to residential areas for many years. 
Who knows how many residents have also become ill and perhaps never made the connection between their symptoms or their cancer diagnosis and these chemical products that they've been exposed to. Um, I think that we all like to think that the EPA is doing its job and it's testing all <laughs> chemicals and pesticides <laughs> properly to make sure they're safe for humans and for the environment. Um, however, the more I read and the more I learn about it, it seems that that is really far from the truth. Um, for decades, our EPA has been in bed with the chemical industry and many commonly used pesticides have been approved for use despite scientific evidence um, not incontrovertible, like not all proven in humans, but leading mm -hmm. people to think that it's linked to many health issues and environmental damage. So um, uh, sadly, pregnant women and children are the most sensitive uh, to these types of toxins. Um, uh, earlier this year, um, I was walking by my house you know, down by the Mill River and we saw signs announcing the glyphosate spraying on the dikes. And that was the signs were posted only less than 24 hours before it was supposed to begin. So I was giving very little notice. I know I'm sensitive, so I had to find a place to stay away from my home so I wouldn't be close to that. Um, and we wrote to Donna Lascalia, the director of the DPW, and she claimed in an email that glyphosate is completely non-toxic to mammals. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I guess that's the information that she's been led to believe. Um, but respected scientific studies show a strong correlation between glyphosate and serious health and environmental hazards, um, including health concerns such as disruption of hormonal systems and gut bacteria, damage to DNA, developmental and reproductive toxicity, birth defects, urine toxicity, and cancer. Glyphosate-based herbicides can also affect and probably harm all aspects of an ecosystem, including soil biology, non-target plants, aquatic organisms, amphibians, reptiles, pollinators, wild animals, as well as household pets. Um, Monsanto first learned of glyphosate's cancer risk in 1983, and the EPA knew about it. However, the EPA used research funded by Monsanto instead of independent scientific studies to determine whether glyphosate was safe. Monsanto paid a chemical industry front group the American Council on Science and Health to push back and hide the scientific findings on glyphosate linked to cancer. Uh, recently, juries have begun awarding settlements reaching into the billions of dollars to people whose cancers uh, were caused by glyphosate products. And in addition, glyphosate herbicides have now been banned or restricted in many countries, including Malawi, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Bermuda, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Denmark, Bahrain, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, the Czech Republic, Austria, Germany, as well as a growing number of American cities and towns. Ms. Liscalia also claimed that the glyphosate's, glyphosate sprayed in Northampton was not mobile once applied to the foliage, that it drips into the soil where it degrades quickly. Unfortunately, this is also false information. Studies show that glyphosate can remain chemically unchanged in the environment for long periods of time. Even when it binds to soil particles, it can cyclically lose its attraction to soil and become active as an herbicide again, possibly persisting for many years depending on conditions. Um, so I've recently learned that Smith College is aware of the pesticide safety issues and they're now seriously considering a switch to a full organic landscaping program, which is really awesome. And I hope, uh, I urge them to move forward in this new direction. And I hope you guys will also um, give proper consideration to these issues and um, hopefully abide by the precautionary principle, which says that even if there is inconclusive or firm scientific evidence, if there is science pointing to something causing harm and that it may be causing harm, then you, you don't want to go there until you're sure that it's safe. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a minute. Quick question. Sure, go ahead. When did you contact the Public Works Department? Uh, when you had right the after we saw the signs, we contacted them the next day. But the time frame was it this the year? The time frame we, we had last year. This year. It was this year. Oh, it was this year. It was this okay. year. Thank yeah. you so much. And it would be great if, <clears throat> when spraying is going to happen, that people could be notified. You know, especially for chemically sensitive people like me, where sure. if I get sprayed, it's going to impact my health for mm -hmm. a long time. And so. 
if there was a, a better way for people to know when it's happening and where ahead of time so they can make plans not to be exposed if they don't want to be if you're going to continue to do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yep. And um, I, I just want to reiterate that we are also accepting documents by email at Northampton Pesticide Reduction at gmail.com. We welcome any documents that you might want to submit as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I typed up just what I read today. We'd yeah. like to pause it. Thank you. Uh, Dale Lapointe. 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 Sorry about that. No, that's fine. Sure. Okay. I just have two quick comments, um, and I want to thank, thank this yeah. um, group for, for doing this work. It's so important. Well, if you could come a little closer just so that the camera captures you. No. You're in a little dead zone there. Thank you. Um, I was walking downtown um, near the uh, parking lots um, right, right below um, Pulaski Park this summer. And um, it was sure, at a time I had seen, <laughs> uh, shortly before that, I had seen someone walking around with a, a sign on that said that there was glyphosate spraying being done in, in Northampton. It was a protest sign. And, um, and sure enough, here is an, a, an applicator going along, putting the um, spray. I don't know that that was glyphosate. It seemed to be some kind of herbicide that was being applied to the, the bricks, the sidewalk, and, and the edge of the pavement. And I was walking along with my dog. I did not want my dog to be walking in the space where that person had just gone through. Um, there was a woman with a toddler. The toddler was falling and getting up and going along shortly behind this um, person doing the application. The person was not wearing any protective gear whatsoever. I mean, he did have on long pants and, and jeans, but and, and uh, sneakers. But you know, he, he didn't have gloves. He didn't have a mask. He didn't have anything that would have protected him from any spray bath. And it was granted the you know the uh, nozzle type application that was supposed to be you know directed and not allow for for any um, you know spraying up into the uh, air. I wonder if that person had been wearing a sign as big as the protest <laughs> had worn that said, I am applying, you know, a, a, an herbicide, regardless of what the herbicide would have been. Maybe more people would have been A, aware and B, concerned that there was something being applied here that they couldn't see. And where were you going to put the sign though, and let that toddler know? that they shouldn't be walking right behind someone who's, who's spraying this application. So that's, that's my, my um, first point. Um, and related to that, I don't want my dog bringing the pesticides home. She picks it up on her feet. She brings it home. It goes on the carpet. There have been many studies that show that um, pesticides persist inside in the indoor environment much longer than outdoors because you don't have the sun to break it down you don't have the rain to dissipate it so it's a it, so it's going to be there much longer and perhaps more um, problematic because of who's going to be in close contact with the rug if you have children grandchildren whatever that so that's my first concern um, and then the other is um, Northampton has the opportunity to be a model. And it would be very helpful to us to, who, who are in places that have commercial lawn care companies um, taking care of our lawns. We don't really have control over who is hired to do that work. Mm -hmm. But if we can say, look, the city of Northampton is able to manage these expansive lawns, these playing fields, all these grounds, organically, then isn't this something that you can also do? If it has been done here, then we can um, show them the model. We have already used that to some extent in our community. We are getting our um, management to move away from heavy um, pesticide four or five times a year applications, which they had been doing. and. Um, only one this year and they say they're going to uh, move to an organic um, way of doing it. And this was based on being able to say, look at the playing fields in Florence. 
look at the areas that are already being organically managed. You know, here's a model. So, thank you. Larry Cochran. Thank you. I actually didn't prepare anything. I was just going to listen. But you had a line about the Northampton Community Garden allowing the use of pesticides and chemicals. And I co-direct the Community Garden Committee with Betsy Wolfson. So I wanted to let you know that those rules are still in place. And when we took over the committee, managing the committee in the summer of 2017, there were a lot of things for us to tackle. And working with the city to change those rules from the top down didn't seem like the smartest thing to do. And we're also an all-volunteer committee. So what we focused on in the interim in, at baseline is education. We started something called the Under the Mulberry Tree. We have a big old mulberry tree that the gardeners fought to save from being cut down. And we started an Under the Mulberry Tree speaker series. And we have invited professors from UMass, master gardeners, and other knowledgeable speakers to talk about organic gardening, to talk about cover cropping, to talk about integrated pest management to talk about ways to convert gardens, whether they're big or small, into healthier ecosystems. We focused a lot on soil. There were some rules, old garden practices that had been in place for a long, long time because people knew different things then. And so one of the things that we do now, we just did it on Saturday, garden cleanup was, we do not require gardeners to take out everything in their gardens down to bare soil and we fix soil for the winter. We know there's nothing worse. We're actively working on helping them get cover crops and covers in. And so I guess I would want everyone to know that even though the rules, those rules of the garden may still be in place, we'll work on changing them. But along the way, it's made a lot more sense for us to educate people along the way and to bring them up to speed. And most likely, we're guessing at this point, there are some gardeners. In, our garden is probably the biggest and the oldest in the region. It's been around for, as far as we can tell, at least 45 years. We have 415 plots and just under 300 gardeners. Some of them have been there the entire time. So old habits die hard, which I think is what you found when people revert back to, to old ways. Mm -hmm. But if we can educate them along the way, bring new people in, and all of our classes are also open to the public, and so we can share that knowledge. The city's actually been great working with us. Both the mayor and the rec department approved um, something that we started two years ago, which is called the Clean Plant Sale. We invited, um, without any requiring of them any special permits, invited half a dozen small local organic farmers to come into the garden and to sell their plants. They, they take care of sales tax, they take care of um, all the individual sales, but didn't have to apply for a special permit, which made it really easy for them. We offered it to the gardeners, but we also opened it up. And I think the first year we had about 300 people, last year we had just under 500 people come in to buy plants from from those gardeners. So our goal has been not only to bring clean plants, meaning non-pesticide treated plants to our gardeners, but also to sell them to the public and to support the local gardeners. That's what we're working on. Thank you for everything you're doing. Larry, can I ask you a question? I yes. feel like we would be remiss if we didn't bring up something that maybe you don't want to talk about, but oh, no, that is the Japanese knotweed yep. on the side and how that, yep. how the kind of, uh, Discussion has gone on around that and um, a little bit of a battle, I think, between yeah. different factions of folks. So along the back road of the garden um, has been, there's a very steep hill and it runs down into fields and there's um, some water down there. There has been Japanese knotweed growing for as long as anyone can remember. And it has continued to spread. Um, when, it, when we first came on board, it was probably about 12 feet tall along the road. The garden committee and talking to gardeners, um, the garden committee decided that it was important to figure out a way to get rid of it. And so we had a couple of people on the committee do research to find out ways that the best way to, um, to get rid of it. 
And I should preface that by saying we worked with the DPW for two years getting them to mow it down. The issue was not the knotweed that was on the top of the road, but the knotweed that was along the steep hillside along the, along the back side. And nobody could get to that. Um, so the garden committee did research and talked to a bunch of people and we came to sort of an IPM decision-making treaty that the, the best way to treat it would be to hire um, a group um, from Turner's Falls um, that specializes in treatment and the application of glyphosate, pure glyphosate. They would have been injected, painted on the leaves, um, and so that's what we came to the CPC writing grant about. And uh, people responded negatively. The CPC didn't want to step into it. We know there have been issues with Fitzgerald Lake previously as well, and so that, that stopped that work. In the interim, what we've done with it um, is continue to work with the planning department. The city, for us at the garden, because we're all volunteer and many of us still work full time, um, the issue of dealing with it, our concern is um, food security. Our concern is that the knotweed had already broached the back road, um, which is 20 feet wide and has begun popping up in the garden. So our concern from that perspective was protecting the garden and preventing it from, from running amok in the garden and getting in the way of people growing food. Um, we've continued to work with the DPW to keep it mowed down. Some people are popping up and coming in to do some experiments with smothering and um, other ways of cutting it down. We've also been working directly with Wayne Faden to, and I know he's written a grant, to come up and experiment with using goats, at least on part of it, and we're great with that. I personally think that there are, um, like some of the people have said, I don't use chemicals, wouldn't use chemicals, but in this situation, based on the fact that we really wanted to keep, want to keep it out of the garden any more than it's already there, talking to as many people as we talked to, glyphosate on not we seem to be the best control. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be sad if we didn't, if we gave up the right to be able to use it in select situations, highly controlled situations, when it's for something this important. I wouldn't use it along, advocate using it along the Mill River where it's, you know, it's all over the place. This was a very specific situation and a very specific um, geological situation that the steepness of the hillside really precluded humans doing it. Goats could do it, do it potentially, but there's a high cost um, and I think it would be sad if we didn't reserve those rights in certain situations. Um, does that answer Thank your you. question, Liz? Thank you. Um, when you mentioned um, it's a little frustrating to do the top-down approach, and you opted for education, which is great. Um, in your thinking, is it like it's difficult to have a rule or a regulation? Is that what you meant by that? You know, the, the, this garden has been here for a long time, and the gardeners have been there, for, a lot of the gardeners have been there for a long time. And the people that use um, chemicals are people who have used them for a long time. We considered the cost issue. We considered the fact that gardeners tend to be feisty, and it's like hurting cats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we thought we would start with education. Um, you know, we have people who only speak Spanish. We have people who speak Swahili and French. We have people who only speak Portuguese. So there are a lot of nuances about handing out materials. We have people who um, are illiterate, and so how can we train them? How could we, we really wanted to embrace, if we were gonna do a top-down rule and such a, a, a change in the rules, mm -hmm. that we wanted to embrace everybody and come up with solutions to be able to educate. Mm -hmm. And so we chose the bottom-up and the education as at least we could start there mm -hmm. and, and move people in that direction. And of the, which is, which is really um, perceptive of you. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, and I'll be passionate of us because yes. people, a lot of people were very um, sensitive to food security. And sure. I know, I we used to walk through the gardens as a photographer taking pictures well before I was involved there. And I've seen a huge shift from flowers to produce, to vegetables and fruit. And so people really, we have a lot of young families, that's in our work really hard, we're almost at capacity, um, which is wonderful. We have a lot of older um, gardeners. We understand the social implications of it in addition to the food implications of it. So we wanted to take all of that into consideration. Thank you. 
And just off the top of your head, of the 300 individuals who have a plot, 300 plus, yep. um, percentage mm -hmm. of those that are using? I'm something? guessing, based on number of plots, not number of gardeners, mm -hmm. I'm guessing probably about 30%, 25 to 30% are, are using, are using non-organic. Non-organic, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So, thanks, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Marilyn O'Neill. about this issue and it seems to me that it doesn't take rocket science in any way to be aware of the detrimental effects of chemicals and um, with all due respect to the, the big picture of cancer of the people I, I don't want to undermine that in any way there's another big picture of the whole interconnectedness of life and how these chemicals affect the very beginning of that life process with insects and who eats the insects and then who eats you know the birds and how it eventually gets to us that way um, and the other aspect that I wanted to point out was that um, well I, two, two more aspects I really appreciated sir your your point of how you have used the chemicals very specifically but it seems that's the uh, not the common practice, that it's more or, or less controlled than that, so, so I'd like that to be taken into consideration. And in terms of the honeybee population that is getting devastated by this, and I, I'm, again, I'm not very good at, I can't even say the name of the chemical, so I haven't referred to it other than Roundup is how I know it. Um, but I did hear a study on NPR that in France they've done some research and are finding the honeybees making um, great strides and coming back under organic practices and away from hmm. chemical farming. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's all you. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Uh, Judy Hyde is next, but I think she's left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Tusi, did you want to say something? I'd love to, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tusi Gastengay, and I live on Willow Street in um, Florence. And um, I have a completely organic one acre of land that I use. Can you move a little bit closer just so your, the camera's picking you up, the camera over there? Uh, the you don't have to, yeah, but that's, that's good. Thank so you. I have one acre of land which I garden. I have flower gardens, herbs, fruit trees, um, uh, vegetables, and everything is been completely organic for the last 15 years. And I do have bittersweet and not weed, and I cut it back myself every year, and I saved all the trees along the woods there. And I was thinking, well, if I can save my one acre from the not weed and the bittersweet, certainly if we get teams of people going out and helping to cut this not weed and this bittersweet, Women Outdoors is something I'm part of, and we've had teams of people going down to the Connecticut River, to um, the area where there's lots of bittersweet, and cutting down the bittersweet, and so saving a lot of those trees. And you probably know about the Western Mass Pollinators Group that has, mm -hmm. um, at just by volunteers, gathering a bunch of people that planted pollinator plants right here in Pulaski Park, and at the Senior Center and all over the city. Groups of people coming together, making a difference. So let's get the bikers who bike along the bike path where the, this uh, Japanese knotweed is, and a bunch of people to go and cut it back every year. Um, also, <coughs> when we talk about the knotweed that's at the Northampton Community Gardens, it makes me cringe to think of this knotweed on a hill and glyphosate being, being sprayed on that and all that glyphosate going into the soil, which will run into the community garden. No. Every handful of soil has a billion microorganisms in it. And if we're, glyphosate is getting on that level, 
that is going into every plant, going into the water. It goes into the water, it goes into the Connecticut River, which goes into the ocean. And we, you know, we know our oceans are polluted. So to me, it's really stupid for us to be using any of these horrible chemicals that are, we know have, ca have caused cancer are killing the bees and killing our whole food system when we can do something about it. So I would, I would, I really appreciate, by the way, all the work that you guys are doing. Even sitting here for two hours listening to us, it's great. But um, I think that we, I would like to see an immediate ban on it and looking at all the different ways that we can uh, hold back the knotweed and, and, you know, deal with the weeds in holistic ways because we know how to do it if we're willing to put the time and energy into it and use it as an organization tool for our city to bring people together to, to you know, get rid of the Japanese knotweed if it's a problem or, you know, kill the bittersweet. I think we can do it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. That's it for my sign-up sheet, but uh, I think there are other people who joined uh, who haven't had a chance to sign up, and so please, um, if you say your name, I'll, I'll put your name down. Debbie Pastage Clemmer. Debbie Pastage Clemmer, P-A-S-D-R-I-C-H, I think K-L-E-M-E-R. Thank you. Can I make it easy on you? Say your last name. <laughs> Great. So we live uh, right next to the knotweed where they want to inject it and stuff. In yeah, Village um, Yeah, in Village And our house is like Can like you speak up, please? Our, we our house is like 50 feet away from where they want to inject the knotweed. So we walk by there. I walk by there every day with my dogs. I walk through the community garden. Um, I've watched some of the experiments going on with covering the ground or filling things up. And, you know, well, you can talk about our neighbors, but um, downstream from the hill, there's a big um, cistern of water. Mm. There's a lot of peepers there. Mm. So if they do that, it's going to affect the frogs, um, for one thing. The other thing is I'm a natural health practitioner, and I've been doing it for 30 years. I've been practicing here. And I do a lot of nutrition, and I see how glyphosate affects people's health. It ruins your gut biome, which uh, destroys your neurotransmitters. And it's a lot of more of a big deal than people realize. Um, it's in Europe, they only allow like 0.7 parts per billion of glyphosate. And in this country, they allow 700 parts per billion. Dr. Stephanie Seneff has done a lot of research at MIT, and she's linking it to autism and <coughs> Alzheimer's. And, you know, we moved to the, this location because we like the dog park, we like the being outdoors. And frankly, like, when I started hearing this, I was like, I don't want to walk my dog by there anymore. My dog is going to get concentrated Roundup, you know. And then you can come. Mm -hmm. And also, um, we live in Village Hill, so our house is the one closest to the community garden. It's right out our back window. And um, this past year, we lost two neighbors to cancer. One was lung cancer, so who knows how much the uh, chemicals had to do with that. But you know, she was fairly young. And the other one died pretty suddenly of leukemia. And she was probably in her early 60s, late 50s. So but she was healthy to care of herself. And then our other neighbor lost her dog suddenly from some kind of rare heart tumor. And that dog used to sit outside all the time. And um, the neighbor across the street uh, used glyphosate and up in her yard. So, you know, it does damage to, to us. I've had cancer twice and I don't want to, you know, go for round three. And that's one of the reasons we moved up here from New York because it's clean air and clean environment. And we're trying to get it out of Village Hill also. <coughs> so, you know, it's, it's scary to see our neighbors passing away too soon. And we do question if this is something to do with it. Mm. Yeah, and I, I understand the, you know, people worried about their food and it's important to be able to grow food. It's just, if they could just, like this other person was saying, if we could just 
go and help out, I'd be happy to go help pull it out or do whatever has to be done instead of using the chemicals. I would do it every day if I had to because it's just, it's that important to have, you know, not just us, but all the animals, you know, all, there's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful spot. There's a lot of birds, there's a lot of um, hawks that swing by and uh, hunt for rodents and things like that, and there's tons of dogs and um, the frogs right downstream, because all that water, it goes into the cistern, and then there's like a little stream behind our house that goes right into the Mill River. We have deer that come in our backyard, and they drink from that, you know, so it's it's not just affecting the knot wheat, it's, it just shuts off the biome. It kills, the reason that Monsanto was able to do it is because it kills the bacteria in your gut. And you need your bacteria in your gut to like make vitamins and neurotransmitters. So um, that's how they were able to get it through is because it doesn't directly attack your cells, it attacks the biome. And, and so that's, that's pretty much it. But I'm really glad that you guys yeah, thanks for doing this. willing to listen. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to clarify one thing. Um, there has not been any glyphosate sprayed or applied to the knotweed outside of the community garden. I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Mm. Yeah. There was a proposal, right? Um, but it has not happened. Yes. But I do see people quality. in the garden like with the sprayers, so there are people in the garden yep. itself. So. But I, I do want to ask, based on that, the location that you're talking about, down that hill sits Smith Agricultural um, Cornfield property. Yes. And so my thinking is, I, I personally am not sure what's happening there to grow that corn. Do you yeah, I've wondered too if they spray the corn too, or it's, you know. Because that's a large piece of land yeah. where the corn is, right near your home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> That's a good question. And we don't see it. I mean, I don't look that carefully, but it's sure. like there's a lot of weeds growing around the corn. So we do question it. Mm -hmm. I guess what we're learning is corn is a primary crop for. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah and also, like our neighbors, uh, the condos and the Christopher House, and, uh, they spray. They, you know, they have the little yellow signs up. And I just, I don't even walk by with the dog because. Mm. They spray a couple times a year, and, um, just to keep weeds out. You know. Dandelion is really good for your liver. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, um, since you guys came in late, you didn't hear, and I don't know if this this is, doesn't seem to be common knowledge, but um, it's not the city council's jurisdiction to um, to mandate how private property is managed. And a lot of the places you're talking about are private property, so you know Village Hill and, and how people decide to um, you know what to use there is is beyond our ability to actually yeah. um, affect it because the state has a preemption law that says that municipalities can only control how municipal areas are managed. So just know that that yeah. you know there's only so much that we may be able to kind of shift, and it's only municipal property. We are trying. You know, amongst our neighbors, we're trying to get it yeah. uh, banned within Village Hill also. Mm -hmm. and we're kind of disappointed that people didn't show up today because I did let everybody in Village Hill know that this was happening mm -hmm. mm -hmm. in sessions. So. I did a presentation to it a meeting about all the chemicals and what they do. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, everybody's on board for not using it, but um, mm -hmm. it doesn't, you know, like the Christopher House and all those places you can't really do too much about. Christopher House. Yeah. And probably those subsidized condos, right? Are using it? Yeah, and there's. Uh, and the houses. Yeah, there's condos. And there's so, houses uh, what there. might be under our purview, though, is to make a recommendation for more public education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could mm -hmm. uh, include these entities in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else interested in making a comment? Could I? I I'd, I'd like to make a comment if I may. Okay. Before uh, we break Penny up. And then, uh, so this, I meant to say this earlier, and I forgot. So in addition to preventing things, just because of the camera thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in addition to preventing the use of chemicals, 
I think there are some proactive things that we could do to control pests. One of the pests that we all worry about is mosquitoes and mosquito-borne illnesses. And the best control is bats. I think it would be wonderful if the city would put up bat houses and use <coughs> bat attractors in them. It's been shown in other countries that that's the mo within three years, bat um, mosquito-borne illnesses drop way down as soon as you put in these big bat houses. And the other thing, someone at the beginning said something about ant control. And, you know, ants can, if, if ants are where you don't like them, there's something called diatomaceous earth. Diatoms are ancient critters that lived eons ago, and you can mine their sharp little shells and put them where they will cut the shells of insects, and insects die. But this stuff is completely innocuous to people. Some people eat it to clean out their guts. So it's inert thing, it just cuts insects and exoshells. And that's another control mechanism we could use that is not dangerous to mammals in any way. Thank you. Thank you. Bob? <clears throat> Somebody said earlier that the satisfaction of using herbicides was spraying it on a plant and watching it die. I think this is a gross misapprehension of what actually goes on. And I would point out that once an invasive plant species, for instance, blankets an area, it denies that land to the use by the native ecological users of that piece of land. And that by removing invasive species, you can actually promote <coughs> the growth of native species that provide nectar for the insects, that provide uh, seeds for rodents and other small animals to eat, uh, the leaves and the stems and so forth that are eaten by other herbivores such as deer. So I think that um, one has to understand that there are great advantages in removing invasive plants. And in some cases, where you have large stands of invasive plants, you cannot hope to do that by hand pulling or digging or whatever. The problem is too big, there are not enough people available, and the methods are very often ineffective. I pointed out the example of the treatment of Phragmites common reed in the Broadbrook Marsh. There were several monotypic stands <coughs> of Phragmites. They were treated with herbicide, they died, and an analysis showed that 30 species of native plants grew where those, those Phragmites had grown. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important point to remember. I would also like to point out that a causal effect of herbicides and cancer is simply does not exist. The studies that have been done both by the um, uh, IARC, the International, I forget what it is, Research Cancer, the WHO affiliate, and by the National Institutes of Health, which reached different conclusions, were statistical studies. They were not biochemical studies looking at whether glyphosate could cause cancer. And I think it's very important to distinguish between those two kinds of study. As Len pointed out, the direct effect of glyphosate uh, as a uh, carcinogenic uh, agent is, um, the evidence for it is practically non-existent, but possibly it might act as a promoter once a predisposition, predisposition for a cancer were actually underway in the, the, the body of the patient or the person acquiring that disease. So I think I would appeal to you to understand the science behind what's going on here and to take the science into account rather than the appeal of eliminating the use of herbicides completely on the basis of some fear of chemicals. 
How many of you have read the label on your bathroom cleaner? <laughs> How many have read the label on some of the prepared food products that you buy in supermarkets? I don't use any Isn't of that enough? Any 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 <laughs> well, they're perfectly legal and there's no movement to remove bathroom cleaners. Yes, there cleaners. is. I, I will... no, excuse me. There's no legal movement to remove bathroom cleaners from supermarkets. Yeah. Thank you. Can, can I say something in response to that? Yeah. And then we have Len. And who else wanted to speak? I'm sorry. I, 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 want, I want to briefly mention yeah. two things. Yeah. Number one, there's a local problem that you, you see here. Forward, please, like, Hi. so the camera picks you up. We want you on camera. Oh, okay. I got a smile, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's, there's two problems. One is what's happening on a local level here. There's also this huge problem if you go out to a state like Missouri and take a ride, you'll see miles and miles of soybeans. Miles and miles, you can't see the end of it. Every one of those plants is a Roundup resistant and every one of them is treated. The whole state is covered with this stuff. It is how these states survive. They, th this is a, a huge national or world problem. To get this food, they have to suppress the weeds in some way. Yeah. Unless they find another way, you'll always have this stuff if you want to have an economy that works. And this is a huge problem, a societal problem. On the other hand, I just wanted to mention, the trouble with the carcinogenesis <laughs> studies is that in order, and I've done these things, in animals, very often when you give this compound, you give way more than we would be receiving. We, we exaggerate the thing in order to see what's happening. So as you go down lower and lower in, in, in the amount that you give, and there's a famous saying, the, the dose discern, determines whether it's a remedy or poison. This substance, if you get low enough, will probably do very little. Like, for example, the effect on mentioned bacteria. The, the effect on bacteria has only been shown slightly in the gut of a bee and a couple of other places. There's no evidence that I've seen that our gut is affected by the amount that we take in. The, the problem then is how much of this stuff is getting in and when you, the only solution that I can see temporarily is a very judicious use of it on these little plots and things. But the big issue still remains. And I just want to say one thing, there is a huge study going on right now. It's funded by, I don't know, one in Europe, one here, trying to look at whether this is really carcinogenic at doses that we will actually receive. And somebody's mentioned the precautionary principle. I forget who did it. I think they're right. If something is possibly there, you got to keep your eyes out open. And I think that if you have a few plants here and somebody's totally covered and they're watching it and it's covered and whatnot, it might be okay. But the issue, the big issue still remains. We have genetically modified food, which is what's covering most of the land. I don't know if it's out here in these cornfields, but I have a feeling it is. Unless we want to go backwards, and how much of the world could be fed with organic right now? It's a tiny percentage. I don't know, somebody might know, but I thought I saw 3% of all the food that people eat now is organically grown. So in order to get it to be 50% is going to have a total change in the way we go about it. farming. Mm -hmm. With that, I'll stop. Thank you. Yes. I'm going to have very quick. I, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. My name is Ashley Schaefer. Ashley Schaefer, thank you. And I live on the land that is right in front of um, the Sylvester Road plot. Farmland. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to say that um, my councilman spoke, mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to say that I don't think that putting out signs to say that they're going to spray is um, much of a compromise mm -hmm. at all. Um, I have two little kids, and we have animals, and we moved out there uh, 12 years ago to be in nature, and um, now they're spraying, spraying glyphosate in our front yard. So mm -hmm. um, just telling me that they're going to spray glyphosate doesn't seem like a great compromise to me. That's all.
going to ask you, we have your letter as part of our public record. Yeah, too, just so. in listening here, I just wanted, yeah, to, I just wanted to reassure you, you that we've got that on public record, too. Thank you. Um, Kate? Okay. Yeah, Kate. Okay. Did I see another hand? No. Okay. You may yes, have the last one. I'm back. sorry. Oh, okay. All right. So in the way back, you'll be last. I just want to provide a rebuttal about this. You know, first of all, when people get sick, they're not always hey, just a little closer this way. Okay. Just they're not just always in a full-blown disease state. It can be a chronic illness where it doesn't show up on tests. Uh, but the the biggest thing is in my presentation. I'm just looking it up really quick. I have an article from Scientific American saying. Uh, Widely used herbicide linked to cancer. I don't think the Scientific American is a is a you know publication that's inaccurate. I think they're pretty even keeled. New York Times weed killer long cleared is doubted. So the piece too about you know Switzerland and countries like that that are pretty mindful of health uh, banning these these uh, pesticides is tricky. I think that's something to consider. I think we could follow their lead. They do a lot of things that are really smart. Um, I think a lot of the studies that these gentlemen are talking about are backed by Bayer and Monsanto. And it's yeah. not pure science. That's, 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 that's just not right. No, that's not fair to say. Some of them are. Would you like to speak? Yes, please. Um, can you tell me your name? Uh, I'm Louise Smallen. Oh, of course. Uh, I just also have a rebuttal about um, the fact that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, for example, glyphosate has uh, not been um, really proved as carcinogenic. Well, I mean, there are um, certainly um, um, court cases which have maybe not, well, I mean, that's one way to look at it, uh, is that uh, the courts have allowed um, some plaintiff to claim the fact that they have non-Hodgkin uh, disease, um, leukemia, uh, due to the fact that they had worked with um, uh, with glyphosate uh, and they won their case and there's currently 9, 000, over 9,000 uh, lawsuits uh, against specifically the use of uh, uh, glyphosate so <laughs> I guess that's a very debatable um, position that um, it's not being proven or harmful uh, and also, I guess, the other thing is this idea that uh, here it's, it could be used only a little bit. The problem is that um, glyphosate is used as a desiccant in general on, uh, on, um, on, on the harvest. So we are already, through our food, uh, um, we already have exposure to glyphosate. And so what we're asking the city of Northampton is uh, not anymore, I mean, I know that, that, that you're working only on public plan and so on, and I think that we've made it clear also that we would like you guys to also work on education because I think that if the city doesn't apply glyphosate or other herbicide that are deemed to be uh, harmful. Uh, you're showing leadership and uh, that people will follow, that the people on, uh, on private land or um, on land that is not being um, um, under the jurisdiction of the city of Northampton will follow um, just because it's clear uh, to to many, many, many of us, it's very clear that it's dangerous and that people uh, need to be educated. So um, 
so I would like very much the city to um, move to move on on being a leader that that they can be. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. We will be uh, taking all of your comments into consideration, and whatever documents you would like to submit, we are open to receiving them. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Mm -hmm. <laughs>